I'm always recommending the rail to people who say, where should they send their poems? You know, if I meet a new good poet, and I say send them to the Rialto, because they're very eclectic, they publish all kinds of poetry, it just has to be good. And uh, so, obviously, that's why it's kept going like this. It's the poet's magazine, it's the one the poets like. Anyway, um, I'm going to read five poems, I think, and the first one, first three were all published in the Rialto. The first one's called Mr. Dolman. This is from a sequence about my childhood during the war. And I've got a lot of stuff about families in this book. Mr. Dolman. My mother, dusting Mr. Dolman's parlour in the winter of 1944, misplaced one of his Staffordshire dogs by an inch or two. Or he keeps the thrrr, the old man snarled as he moved it back. Thirty years later... Oi keeps he there, I'd say to my son as he searched for something. <laughs> Thirty more years and the Wiltshire burr resounds again in Andrew's own house, away in a different hemisphere. Washing the dishes, I hold up a jug. Where does this go? Oi keeps he there. <laughs> Do his daughters think of it as merely something Dad says? Or will they confer another generation of currency on a sound bite uttered they don't know where by someone their grandmother's family lodged with? for a month or two in the Second World War. Then this is for one of, well, one of my granddaughters, but not, um, not those ones. Um, this one's a younger one, who was now three, but I wrote this poem when she was a little bit younger. It's called Fenlander, so I sent it to the reality because it's sort of East Anglian, you know, kind of um, geographically appropriate. Um, I'm, every time I get a new lion entering the family with some new um, mother of some new infant, I do the family history research and the, this little girl's ancestors came from the fence. There are some birds in this. We've had lots of birds this evening. These are the fens, and suddenly I half expect the ghosts of your local ancestors to flap up hooting out of the black soil some of them helped to drain. How will they be disguised? Geese will they be? Snipe? Mallards? Two centuries ago, when all this was water, they were hatched around here. Their very names have wings. Samuel Spinks and his grandmother's Anne Bird and Elizabeth Sparrow. I'm not making this up, and you were too young to think it odd. Perhaps they'll waddle in, kitted out in bills and feathers, with fluffy, strokeable breasts. Would you like that, my little ducky? <laughs> <laughs> and um, these are some actual birds. I'm in sort of slight mourning for these robins because they have, I think, probably, um, robins only mate up in the winter anyway, but there was this loving couple that I had and that would come to be fed when I called them and um, they disappeared during the cold winter and I think probably the worst happened. However, it was lovely while it lasted so I wrote this at the time. It's a very sentimental bird poem. To the Robins. Innocent receptacles of my love which I convey in the form of mealworms when I can get them or at other times disguised as tiny morsels of cheese. I gaze into your eyes one at a time and you gaze back, trying to predict me, lurking hopefully on the windowsill, but ready to fly if I turn nasty. Your love is only for each other. It is embodied mostly in food. What you really like is courtship feeding, beak to beak, as if posing for spring watch. When he jumped on you, at this point the pronoun bifurcates from dual to singular, my fellow female, he was often a second. You quivered with astonishment for minutes. You definitely preferred the foreplay, the chocolates and champagne, as it were, in view of which, except my platonic offering, a bowl of little wrigglers. <laughs> in fact, I nearly wrote a poem about the mealworms, but <laughs> there is a limit to my uh, affection for small wildlife. Although I was terribly upset the other night when I found our friendly local spider had got drowned in the sink if I'd washed the dishes that morning. <laughs> I read a poem about death. I, I read poems about death. I write poems about death quite a lot, so here's one, but it's, it's not so spiders, it's people. It's 
put outside the crematorium. Floating with death after my third funeral in a month, I chat with the undertaker, a dashing figure in his designer beard and frock coat. He was at school with my son. They used to play in his father's workshop. One day I'll come here in my coffin, I tell him. I'd like you to see me off. Andrew will arrange it. How's the family? The last stragglers have viewed the flowers and are drifting towards their cars. The vicar has apologised to me for the poem he read with such professional gravity. Some of my neighbours are walking home. Peggy was local, the pet shop lady. The sun is shining calmly. I could almost get used to this death business, except that our last funeral was for a baby whose grandmother has just been telling us how she helped to wash and dress her for it and how hard it was to get her vest on. And this is back to my well, childhood. This is actually my teens. I was born in New Zealand, came to England as a small child during the war, went back after the war and had to settle in and try to turn into a Kiwi. And this is part of that attempt. And it was at the time just after clothes rationing in England, so we'd arrived with clothes that we'd been handed, had handed down to us from various friends and well-wishers. And uh, I, this didn't happen in New Zealand either. It's about being embarrassed by your parents, you know what that's like. I called it Strangers on a Tram. I was on a tram going home from school when who should get on it but my mother, wearing the brown tweed costume Mrs. Dowell passed on to her before we left England. This wouldn't have been so bad except that she'd let the hem down because Mrs. D had said skirts were going to be longer. Well, if so, New Zealand had not yet heard. <laughs> Mothers were supposed to be stout with grey hair and not go around predicting the new look. <laughs> there were some girls on the tram I sort of knew. I pretended this woman was a stranger. Amazingly, she pretended the same, <laughs> apart from giving me a furtive wink. How dare she have the cheek to understand me? <laughs> it was hard to work out what to resent. 